dear brothers and sisters, as we respond to this hymn and song of calling on our Lord to listen to our prayer and our centering him, let us begin by emptying our hearts and minds from all the thoughts and emotions that distract us from God. Let us empty our minds from all of the thoughts that distract it, thoughts of family, thoughts of work, thoughts of ambition. Empty our hearts from all of the attachments that we have and imagine ourselves for the next 20 minutes as what Sufis call dying before we die. Because at the moment of death, we shall be forcefully detached from everything that we're attached to, from family, from work, from anything that has to do with this life. But the one thing that we cannot detach from is our attachment from our Creator. For God the Almighty has said that He created us in His own image. And that image lies not in our physiology, lies not in our emotions, lies not in our thoughts, but the image of God lies most strongly in our soul. Because it is the soul that is eternal. It is the soul that was created from a breath of God. In our holy book, the Quran, God describes the creation of Adam and tells the angels, when I shall have completed his shape or his form from clay, from the earth of the clay, and, hell, and shall have blown into him or breathed into him from my ruh, from my soul, or from my spirit, then fall in prostration to Adam. And therefore, from this verse, we learn that the, the image of God lies in the breath of God which is in our soul, not in our body. It is there that we see God. It is there that we know God. It is there that we are at one with God. And the purpose of all of our religious teachings, the purpose of all of our spiritual teachers and masters, is to help us attain the vision of God help us live in the presence of God. As a Muslim, we believe that God sent prophets and teachers, spiritual teachers, to every community on earth. Most of the prophets named in the Bible, in the Old and New Testament, are also our prophets. Beginning with Adam, continuing with Noah, Abraham, who is the father of, the, of all of our monotheistic faith traditions. His sons, Ishmael and Isaac, are prophets. David and his son, Solomon, are prophets. Jesus Christ is considered one of the greatest prophets. His mother, Mary, is considered the most exalted of all women. There's a whole chapter in the Quran called the chapter of Mary, called Maryam in Arabic. And finally, Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him, whom we believe is the final messenger predicted in the Old and New Testaments to finalize and complete the narrative of that what God wanted human beings to do and how God wanted us to live. And therefore, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, etc., should not be thought of as Muhammad Inc., Jesus Inc., Moses Inc., Buddha Inc., but rather we should think of it all as God Inc., with all of those prophets as regional managers sent by God to different prophets, to different regions, to different countries to teach the same message. We, are, we also believe in our spiritual tradition that every prophet came with a particular signature. Joseph, for example, came with the, with the genius to interpret signs, to interpret dreams. 
Moses came with a law. Jesus was the spiritual teacher par excellence, a Sufi master, as we would say. And Muhammad came to, as, a, as a final overture that embraced and reminded us of all these aspects. So Muhammad came to reiterate and finalize the law that was brought through Moses, to reiterate the spirituality taught by Jesus Christ, also to teach us how to interpret dreams as Joseph did. He also was a king like David and Solomon. So he came with all of those aspects. But for me as a Muslim, I have a special attachment certainly to Muhammad, but also a very special attachment to Jesus Christ. In part because I've studied religions, in part because I've had a dream of both Muhammad and another dream also of Jesus Christ. And there's nothing more profound than having a dream of our prophet. Nothing more personally transformative than such an experience. But now as we're in the season of Lent, let us remind ourselves what it's all about. It's all about God. And how do we surrender to God? And how do we fill ourselves with the reality of God? And how do we ensure that we fulfill God's will of us and not fulfill the will of Satan? For we human beings are the arena in which God and Satan are fighting. We can either offer our souls to God or offer our souls to Satan. And the experience of the prophets is, is so instructive to us. We have in our faith a concept called the precedent, the sunnah is the technical word in Arabic. We as Muslims are required to believe in God and to follow the sunnah of the prophet, to follow the precedent of the prophet which means not only his teachings, but how he practiced his religion, how he practiced his faith. It starts most obviously and the most elementary way with the way we worship, the way we pray, the way we fast, the way we go to pilgrimage and so forth. But it goes beyond that. It goes beyond that in, in that we are destined to go through in our own spiritual journeys, the very experiences that our prophets went through. The prophet Jesus, for example, was tested by Satan. Satan tested him, offered him the world if he would acknowledge Satan instead of God. Guess what? Every one of us will go through this experience. Many of you, I'm sure, have already gone through it. I was, a few weeks ago, with my, uh, bumped into my friend Rabbi Jack Pamporad. And he was telling me about the experience that he went through in his own life. Where he, because of his need to be honest before God, he was condemned by his own community. I said, well, that's what the prophets went through. And he reminded me that in Numbers, Moses was almost stoned by his followers. I said, so if that's what happened to Moses, you have to expect that as being part of your spiritual journey too. Our prophet Muhammad, who taught for about 13 years in Mecca and was attacked and his followers were attacked, some were killed, until finally there was an attempt to assassinate him. And he had to emigrate from Mecca to a town called Yathrib, now known as Medina. If not, he would not have survived. And every one of us goes through a, an experience where we have to leave a place. If we don't leave a place, either we actually die or something within us dies. It could be a place, it could be a job, it could be a relationship. But 
that we have at that moment to let go of our attachments to that place, that job, or that relationship in order to spiritually grow and move on to the next phase of our lives. So it behooves us, my dear brothers and sisters, especially in this season of Lent, because Lent really reminds us of the tests that, that Jesus went through. 40 days of fasting in the wilderness, being tested in the most difficult of tests. But those tests are required. In fact, God says in our holy book, the Quran, do you think we shall leave you alone just because you say we have believed? God assures us we shall try you. We shall test you. We shall test you with loss. Losses of life, losses of wealth, losses of the fruits of your labor until it is clear who amongst you are sincere. The religious path and the spiritual path is both difficult and easy. Or should I say both easy and difficult. It is easy to start, but as you go on, it's like a love relationship. It's easy to fall in love, but it's really difficult to have a, a happy marriage. Jesus was once asked, what is the greatest commandment? <clears throat> he said, to love the Lord, the, to love the God, our Lord or thy Lord, with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and another gospel with all of your strength. Now, what does it mean to love God? How do you love God? I've often thought of this word love. You know, if I say, for example, I love my wife. I love my daughter. I love Mozart. I love lamb chops. Or should I say I love the waffle shop. <laughs> I love um, doing the New York Times crossword puzzle. Well, what does, we use the same word love, but what, how, do, how do I manifest that love? What does it mean to say when I, I love my wife? Well, I cannot project the way I love my wife onto the way I love my daughter. That will be incestuous. That will be a crime. I cannot love my wife or my daughter the way I love waffles. Because that will be a hideous crime to cut them up and cook them and eat them. To say I love Mozart means I love to listen to his music. So you see, when we use the word love to refer to a different beloved or a different object of love, we're referring to a different set of actions. Now, this is all to tee it up. What do we mean when we say, love God? How do you love God? Now, Catholics, part of their love, they actually try to ingest God by right, the sacrament of the Eucharist with the wafer and the wine. But what does it truly mean to love God? And to love God with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your soul and all of your strength. I don't claim to know the answer in full. But all I know is that by raising the questions, by raising the right questions, it helps us struggle with the varieties and ways in which we love God and God loves us. And there will be times, there will be times when we will all go through what has been called the dark nights of the soul, where you will think that God has forsaken us or has forgotten about us. There's a story in our tradition when the prophet was initially a prophet in his very first years, he was approached by a few Jews who were expecting a prophet, and they asked him three questions.
And he said, okay, when I get the revelation, I'll tell you. But then he waited and waited and waited, and it, the revelation didn't come. So after a while, they started mocking him. They said, oh, Muhammad, wadda'aka rabbuk. Your Lord has forsaken you and has forgotten you. Your God hates you. What kind of a God is this who would leave you alone? And it was a difficult time, a time of test for our Prophet, until finally the Quran revealed itself. God swears by the, by the morning and by the night when it is still, your Lord has not forsaken you, neither does he hate you. But this was a test in the life of our own prophet. So sometimes we'll say, God, we pray to God and we say, where's the answer? You're waiting for the answer. How come God is not answering me? Well, God answers at the best time for us, not when we necessarily want it. And therefore, part of the test of our love is our capacity to surrender, to surrender to God. One of the images, or one of the analogies that I like to give that describes, excuse me, that describes the relationship between us and God, between God's will and our will, is that it, life is as if we have been thrown into a deep body of water, with the water representing God and God's will. If you struggle against the water and reject it, you will sink and drown. But if you completely submit, the water will raise you up and you will float. And the task of religious training and religious education is to learn how to swim. How to be a good swimmer in, in, the, in the presence of God and in, in and with the divine will. So we learn to both surrender to the water and swim with it. There will be times when the current will be against us. There will be times when the current will, will push us. But that is the nature of our lives. And to take stock from all of the, both the, the great moments and the difficult moments that all our prophets went through. Jonah, a great prophet, was tossed into the dark waters of the sea and lived for many, many days in the belly of a whale. There will be times when we too shall feel ourselves tossed into the turbulent oceans of this life, swallowed into the, into the belly of some terrible whale, and we will feel that everything is dark around us, that there is no hope. We don't see any glimmer of light, no, not even a tunnel, let alone light at the end of the tunnel. But that too can be part of the divine will. And we have to pray as Jonah did, because perhaps part of the divine will is that this belly will take us and cough us up in another land where we shall be honored. These are all some of the lessons that we have learned from reading the stories of our prophets. The challenge, my dear brothers and sisters, for us to assimilate them in our lives, to remember them when we are tried and tested, and always to say, indeed, thou art our Lord. We love you with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strengths. As Jesus was then asked, what is the next commandment? He said, the second commandment is equal in importance to the first, to love thy neighbor as thyself. And then he adds, on these two commandments hang all of the law 
and all of the prophets. All of the commandments, all of the law flows out of these two commandments. And that, in a sense, the, the, what Christians like to call the first commandment is a vertical commandment, ourselves loving God. And ourselves loving our fellow human beings is what I call the horizontal commandment, which is what the symbolism of the cross symbolizes, these two commandments. And because the first commandment is slightly superior to the first, to the second one, the, the vertical dimension of the cross is a little bit longer than the horizontal one. But that is the symbolism of the, of the faith of Christianity. A symbol of love, of worship, of love of God, and love of fellow human beings. But these two commandments are in fact the commandments of every faith tradition. The prophet himself said, none of you is a believer until you love for your brother or your sister, your fellow human, what you love for yourself. This is how you test. I used to feel jealous if my brother got something which I didn't. Or he got a new house and I didn't. I got a bigger house than I. You feel that pang of jealousy. Now that pang of jealousy in my heart meant I hadn't truly loved God so well. I am not yet a perfected believer. So our task, brothers and sisters, in this life is to perfect our faith to be perfected believers. And you know where you stand in the scheme of things. We all do. And the purpose of Lent and the purpose of fasting, as is the pur purpose of prayer, is to help us, to cleanse us, to purify ourselves, to detach ourselves from our worldly attachments so we are able to reboot and recalibrate ourselves in accordance with God. That God should be our objective. That God should be our goal. And that oneness with God is what it's all about. The whole purpose of our lives is to return to God. God says in the Quran, we exist for God's sake, and indeed to him we are all returning. But we want to return. The greatest pleasure is to return and experience unity with God. Rumi, who is a great spiritual master and Sufi poet, has a story that describes this. He says, a man goes to the house of a friend and bangs on the door and says, bangs, and the voice from inside says, who is there? He says, it's me or correctly, grammatically, it's I. The voice inside says, go away. So after years of spiritual training and development, he comes back again, this time with great respect. He knocks on the door. The voice again asks, who is there? This time he says, it is you, O oh heartbreaker. The door flings open, and the voice says, enter, for there is no room in this house for two eyes. This is why Sufis speak about love and speak about the relationship with God as one of love. And just as when you love a woman or when a man loves a woman or a woman loves a man, you, you still maintain your own selves. But the purpose of marriage is to create a new entity. No longer a why, but a we. Not two eyes, but to create a kind of a teamwork, a kind of a oneness that merges your egos into one. And it's this merging of our consciousness with God's consciousness, the merging of our wills with the divine will, is what this objective is all about. That, my dear brothers and sisters, is the most powerful lesson of fasting is the most powerful purpose of Lent. And just as Jesus helped merge his will more completely and more fully and learned to firewall himself more completely from the tests and trials of Satan, this too is our mission, this is our time, this is our period. 
may God bless us all. May God help you and shower upon us his blessings. May he enable us in this season of Lent to become increasingly purified. May he help us to become more merged with his will and his presence. Amen. Thank you very much and God bless you all.